we're going to read the Word of God, and there's a lot to read this morning. Um, you know, I believe that there is a greater increase every time we gather and we build, like if you did, if you weren't here last week or if you don't remember last week, on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel are the prophetic words that were given. And Karen's made declarations out of it, which she'll send to all of us. But um, I believe that we're on a momentum of God moving. Yeah. That, that we are, we came to outpouring on Friday night. And, you know, we come with our hearts ready, as prepared as possible. But we have no idea what God is doing. We have no idea what he wants to do, when he's going to do it, how he's going to. We just, we got nothing. That's why I always tell God, I've got nothing. And it doesn't matter because he's got everything. And part of this training that we're in right now is learning to be so agile, so flexible, so surrendered. Because, you know, when you're in charge of planning, you would like a plan. Does anybody want to plan when they're in charge of planning? I know I do. I know I do. But this outpouring training for us has been learning to go without a plan. The only plan is Jesus. And whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do, and we are learning how to move with uh, just uh, fluidity when we've got nothing. Because we know who we have inside of us. But as people, we're used to having a structure, a plan, a thought. And this morning when I woke up, I told Chuck yesterday, I said, you know, I prayed and I thought, and I've told you guys this. I said, I have nothing this morning. I have absolutely nothing. And, uh, but I, what I do know is I know who God is and I know he has something. So I just have to be surrendered enough to be able to receive what he has. And the one thing I've learned over these years is I read through the word till it begins to speak. Yeah. You know, have you ever read the word and you're like, okay, yep, that's good. That's good. That's good. Then all of a sudden the word rises and you're like, this is it. This is what God is saying to me. And so this morning I began reading through the word and, uh, and I started getting ready. Chuck's like, what do you got? I said, I still got nothing. And as soon as I said that, I had what I had read in the word and I got here and I was like, okay, so Lord play it out for me. Let's figure out how the word's going to go. And he kept talking to me about it's a journey of remembrance of who he is. Yeah. We've got to keep in front of us who he is. He is God. He is sovereign. He is majestic. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is, he is all, 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 all. He is all. And all doesn't even describe him because I'm sure there's a word in heaven that we're going to learn that better encompasses who he is. And as I was reading the word this morning, I just uh, was overwhelmed and overcome by the majesty of who he is. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the greatness of God. And we're going to prepare our hearts to consume the word that we're going to read. And we're going to read a lot of the word. So, you know, get your phones out, get your Bibles out, whatever you have. Of course, Noah puts it up there. But we're going to consume the word. It's going to become part of our very leave, living, breathing uh, a section of us. A part of, it's just going to entrench us. Um, and that's what I felt like from the Lord today. We're just going to weed out, as we read the word, we're going to weed out, and I'm just asking God to do this supernaturally, anything that does not align with what we read, yeah. and to put the perceptions of him, about him, of the word that are not in order, back in order, and to write on us the word that we read so we can walk out living the word that we've heard yeah. so father we just thank you that your word is alive yeah. it is active yeah. it does cut it does divide yeah. and we're asking you to divide to remove anything that we read that we have misunderstood that we have misperceived that we have filtered through our own Wounds are our own experience instead of the sovereignty of who you are in writing the word. So, Lord, we are trusting you to take 
this word and write in our hearts about the greatness and the wonder and the majesty of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Whew. I, I told Chuck to when I'm at the end of worship, I said, I started to get up. I was like, I'm a little bit wrecked. I'm having a little hard time moving. And I, I don't get swayed easily, but I just, I felt like the presence of God, yeah. the, the worship of God was yeah. so uh, almost intoxicating by the spirit yeah. that uh, I could hardly breathe. So we're going to talk a little bit in Acts, and then we're going to go to Job. And uh, those seem like an interesting combination, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Stephen, who was full of faith. He was picked to serve. He was picked to, uh, to support the apostles. He was full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith. And we're going to start in Acts 7.54. And like I said, we're going to read a lot. So set your hearts and your mind on God. Use what we read to transform me in this moment. So Acts 7.54, as I'll find it, here it is. So we're talking about Stephen being martyred, and it says, when they heard these things, the things that Stephen had shared about the beginning to the end uh, for them to be able to encounter Jesus, it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, isn't it interesting when people hear the truth, we were talking about this in our Bible study yesterday, it either smells like the fragrance of Christ, right. the word says, or it smells like death. Right. Right. And for them, it smelled like death. But being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He is declaring the uh, heavenly vision to all that will hear. They cried out, then they cried out with a loud, loud voice, stopped their ears, refused to hear, and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at, his, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Amen. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at the time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, even except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So here we see a righteous, honored man being stoned to death with Saul being the approver of this. And now we're going to go to Job 38. And I'm sure God is going to weave all this together for us when we get to the end of it, right? Because as I was reading this this morning, God said, go to Job and begin to read who I am. So that's what we're going to read for a few minutes. Job 38, we're going to start in verse 1. And, you know, Job has gone through a difficult time. He has his three friends that are trying to help him. I'm not sure you've ever had anybody try to help you. That's not really helping you. So he, but then God steps in, and God's like, listen to me. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. 
or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Let's turn to verse um, 40. Oh, I'm not sure that's what I... Yeah, that 40. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to read one more verse out of this. 38 verse... Uh, chapter 38, verse 36. Who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? So here is God... And if you remember Job's story, he went through a lot. And we'll pull this back into Acts in a minute. But here is God saying, who are we to question who he is and what happens? Who are we to challenge the God who created everything, who determined the skies, who determined the stars, who determined the size of everything? And if you read on through this, uh, Job 38 through 40, God goes through the whole list of who he is yeah. Yeah. and what he does that is way beyond our understanding to remind us that he is God and he is sovereign. And there are things we do not understand, right. but he does. Amen. And it is a plan way beyond us. Acts 40, verse 6. Then God answered Job out of the whirlwind. I love the whirlwind. If you read Ezekiel, he talks about coming out of the whirlwind, and there's this whole heavenly encounter in this. So when God speaks out of the whirlwind, expect to see the things of heaven. He says, verse 7, it says, Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Have you ever been questioned by God? Has he ever asked you a question, and you're like, Oh, this is not good. <laughs> if you're asking me, then, then obviously I do not know the answer. It's really rhetorical at times. Verse 8, would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like his? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. It's interesting how we, at times, feel like we know more than God knows. We have a better perspective on what is happening than the sovereign God who is over all things. Very interesting. So let's go back down to Acts again, and we're going to start in uh, chapter 9. And like I said, we're going to pull all this together, but when I was reading the Job portion, I read through all of it, and we could have done that, but we would have been here for a while. Um, but God goes through and reminds us in Job these details that we forget, the treasury of snow and hail, that he uses at his will. The, the, the Leviathan, who can pull the hook to capture him? Only God can do these sovereign moves. Okay, Acts 9, verse 1. I have to say, I've, I've, I've been a little trembling at these verses when I was reading them this morning. Uh, 9 verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked, asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So we saw that he was a part of Stephen being martyred, and now he continues his attack. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, 
why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground when his eyes were open and he saw no more. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Here was someone who could not hear who Jesus was through Stephen, but encounters Jesus. And all of a sudden, he is no longer the foe. He becomes the friend. He is no longer against He becomes the voice of God in this season. Let me just read on a little bit. And now there was a certain disciple uh, at Damascus named Ananias. And he said to the Lord, uh, uh, sorry, and to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Taurus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he has He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went on his way. So Ananias was faced with that pivotal decision. He heard the voice of the Lord to send him out to go lay hands on Saul. Saul needed the Holy Spirit the breaking off of the blindness off of him, the Holy Spirit to fill him up so he could go and be initiated into his place. But Ananias, of course, had the fear of Saul because who was he? He was a persecutor of the church, of every person that declared the name of Jesus. And then that pivotal role, Ananias had to decide, do I say yes and overcome my fear because I trust what the sovereign Lord has said to me. And though my mind may have a dialogue, my spirit has a oneness with God that keeps my dialogue from preventing me going forward. It's a hard thing. We're in a hard time right now. We're in a hard season. And I was just telling Chuck this morning, you know, in Florida, we're in a little bit of a bubble. We're in a little bit of a bubble, but in a lot of places, the persecution is real. In, in our nation, the persecution is real. And so we have to understand that God is going to send us into places that are fearful for us, that will cause trepidation to us, that may ha- cause us to think, Lord, don't you know that this will risk all for me if I go. But then we go back and remember, who is God? Who is the one who designed the skies? Who is the one that gives us the display at night, the northern lights (laughs) up up in different places? Who is the one who causes the sun to rise every day? Who is the one who has called us by name for a purpose that is beyond the persecution, or even the martyrdom that we might face. Who is the one who has planned this all for us? You know, it's, it's I know, and you know, uh, it goes on, I'm not going to read it all, but it goes on to talk about how Paul goes to see the apostles and the apostles are afraid of him. They're like, no way. We are not going to engage. But Barnabas has to be the one who opens the door, who who lays his uh, uh, reputation down to get 
Paul inside to see the disciples. Yeah. I mean, to see the apostles. So we're all called for different reasons to take risk that might cost our reputation, that might cost our character because God is going to use us for the breakthrough to the next section, for the breakthrough of the kingdom to the next thing. And in all of the things that go on in our mind as he's calling us, as he's leading us through this process, the one thing that has to be at the top of it is God is sovereign. And he is, he is leading us through. And I've heard his voice. You know, I told him, um, I was laying on the floor uh, just a minute ago, and, I, and, you know, I was talking to God a little bit. A little bit of uh, confession. Uh, because I'm like, God, I don't know why I get anxious about what I do when I hear your voice clearly. Yeah, amen. I know what you want to do. Right. Why does my mind have to debate the thought process when I know that you've got something so much greater for all of us. Yeah. And it's that surrender of what my condition is, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's anxiety, whether it's uh, I'm tired or I had too much coffee, whatever it is. It's the surrender of my condition yeah. in order that God's plan can be released wherever we are. And that's even the testimony that Caitlin gave. You know, this guy was not quite doing it. But you know what? I surrendered my desire for promotion to pray for him, yeah. to bless him, to determine that he is going to be successful. So we have to surrender our condition Amen. in order to receive the fullness that God wants, not only for us, but what he wants to release through us. God is so good to us. And, you know, it was shocking for Ananias to go to him. It was fearful for the apostles to even engage with him. But then they remembered, who do I serve? Who do I serve? And for the apostles, they needed Barnabas to bring him in, to, to bring that memory. You know, sometimes that remembrance of who we serve. Sometimes in the contrast of Stephen's life, who was faithful and righteous and selected, you know, to serve the apostles and martyred in, in a short amount of time. And Saul, who was uh, persecuting the church and, and threatening and putting people in prison and signing off on people's death. Sometimes if we were in that season, if we were back there during that time, we would be going, God, what is going on? How could our brother Stephen be killed by someone who all of a sudden has been raised up in the church to declare the gospel? How can that happen? There's no equality there. There's no fairness there. But you know what? God is sovereign, and we don't understand what he does. And we just have to say, God, I trust you. I don't understand, and I definitely have an opinion. I always have an opinion. Just ask me, you say, do you have an opinion? I have an opinion. But what I need is my opinion filtered through your sovereignty. My opinion has to be filtered through who you are. And if I don't understand, then I can't have an opinion about God that I don't understand what he's doing. Amen. We try to spin God. We try to make it so people can understand when sometimes God hasn't given us an explanation because he does not have to report to us. Right. He does not have to make us feel okay. Right. He does not have to give a, a full report on what he's done today. Right. God, could you send that in triplicate to us so we can distribute it out? We'll send in an email blast. He's like, are you kidding me? I am God. Amen. I am sovereign. You either follow me or you will be lost forever. This is not a uh, consensus. We aren't Christians by consensus. We're Christians by the blood of Jesus. We're followers by the resurrection of the living God. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And what God says is what God says. Whether we actually agree or understand, it doesn't make any difference. When he calls, we answer. 
And when he says, come, we move. Like when I was growing up, if my dad said jump, we jumped. And it's, the, it's a different kind of fear. With my dad, it was real fear. But with the sovereign God, when he says jump, it is a holy fear. We experienced a holiness today in our worship. We experienced a, a wonder of God in our worship today. And God is training us to live out of his holiness not out of our mentality. He's renewing our minds in all of this. It's, a, it's such a contrast as we read Stephen and we read uh, Saul slash Paul. It's such a contrast and it's such a, an awakening of our hearts because, you know, just as uh, the disciples were, the apostles, I was thinking of Peter and John put in prison and an angel gets them out, right. there were those... John the Baptist was put in prison and he was beheaded. Right. And in that, the word says, you know, don't be offended because of this. Because God is sovereign. Okay, we're going to end with this one, this one, uh, this one uh, scripture. It's, it's back in Job. I uh, know it's not. Where am I going? Where am I going? No, tell me. Yes, it is. Job 42, 1 through 6. So I've got two more scriptures I'm going to read. But when we think about... Um, the word really teaches us to discern and identify when persecution abounds, when the enemy is abounding. But he also teaches us to be able to adjust when there's a dynamic shift like with Saul and not be stuck in a place where we were. You know, if, you, if they think about it, they could have never accepted Saul as Paul. They could have said, well, our mindset, we already know what you did. And you will never be in our inner circle. But God said, receive him. And he became, you know, the writer of the epistles and all this kind of stuff. So we have to know when the, the persecutor is promoted into a God voice for him. We have to know when the shift happens. Okay, let me just, let me just read this. I want to read this end of uh, Job because I love it, and I feel like that's what God does for us. It's Job 42, I believe I said. Uh, 42, verse 1, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. We know that, right? right. We know God can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Verse 5 says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes you and that is our prayer God let not only we hear and be transformed but let our eyes be open to see the realness the glory the holiness the manifestation of who you are as the living God so I'm going to have a stand together we're going to read this verse together uh, it's Psalms 145 3 to end and um, I think of my, my new verse for, for this season is, I've been crucified with Christ. <laughs> it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me, yeah. right? And the life which I have now in the flesh, I live in f by faith in the Son of God. Whew. Okay, I want us to read this together. Uh, let's skip over to Psalms 145 if we could. Noah, thank you. So we're going to read this together as one. is just a declaration of us acknowledging God as our sovereign king, okay? So I will extol you, my God, O king. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. So God, we just thank you for showing us 
your holiness this morning, for opening up our hearts to the sovereign ways that you have for us, God. God, we just declare you as the holy God, that there is none like you. There is no God that anyone worships that even is living, much less the sovereign God of all creation. Yeah. So, God, we're, we're, we're saying to you, we love you, Lord. We adore you. We acknowledge you. We, we say whatever your will is, we will step in and do what you've called us to do, whether we understand or not, because your plan, your, your ways are so much greater than ours. So, Lord, we just uh, turn away from all of our thoughts that don't align with who you are. And we turn back to the beauty of your glory. Just like uh, Job said, I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now, Jesus, we see you. Amen and amen.